Definition and Identification of Materials in Alchemy and Chemistry, a short essay by Bruce Mills, otherwise known as the Obligate Pedestrian. It is my personal position that, to quote Dirk gently, everything is connected. To appreciate exactly what alchemy was and how it led to classical chemistry and was part of the background to quantum chemistry, one needs to understand a bit about the socio-linguistic and cultural background of the concepts. I don't go as far as to say that it is all a social construct, but I do say that to be able to extract that which is not a social construct, one has to understand the social context. These essays, thus, often steer a path through culture, history and language, and focus on explicit quotes from contemporary or almost contemporary literature. This means a lot of details, but those details are what eventually form the fabric from which the story is woven. The audience is reminded that several prominent authors of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, including Boyle, Becher, Lamery, Freund and Kiel, did not distinguish strongly between alchemy and chemistry and chemistry. Many writers, especially at about the year 1700, claimed that other earlier writers had misinterpreted the experimental evidence, but this was in the context of self-promotion. They were not objective observers of the validity of the views of these earlier writers. The popular perspective in the 21st century is that chemists denigrated the alchemist and that this was a technical transition that was empirically justified. But this perspective forgets, or offhandedly dismisses, the importance of the fact that the alchemists denigrated the chemists as well. Less so, perhaps, but merely because there was a sociolinguistic transition occurring so that more recent researchers into more recent theories tended to call themselves chemist rather than alchemist. Just as teenagers tend to criticise their parents as century replaces century, it is a common behaviour for scientists of one generation to claim that the scientists of a previous generation were ignorant monkeys who did not know any better and should have gone and looked at the results of the experiments and then they would have seen what idiots they were. In truth, it is a change in interpretation, not a change to more careful observation. The earlier researchers, if they had had a chance to know what the future would bring, might well have considered the future scientists to also have the wrong approach. Don't get me wrong here. Overall, as a social totality, the theories have been improving in their technological implications for a thousand years. This can be considered objective, but not to stem from the replacement of pseudoscience by real science. As a general rule of thumb, I tend to classify the material theories of the period from 1730 to 1930, approximately, as classical chemistry, which was a development of a new way of classifying materials according to conjectured prime materials that began to be called exclusively elements rather than principles. While the word chemistry existed during the 17th century, one can approximate the situation by calling Boyle and Freund alchemists, and then speaking of the theories based on earth, water, air, fire, sulphur, mercury and salt as being alchemy broadly interpreted. Classical chemistry is based on the 100 or so elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium and so on. It has a very large number of axioms. This was probably its biggest flaw. The nomenclature was initiated by Lavoisier, although many of the concepts came from prior research by others. Alchemy, before 1730, divided matter a different way to chemistry after 1730. This was the work of Priestley, Lavoisier, Dalton, Davies and others, culminating the periodic table of Mendeleev, which can be considered the foundational axiom of classical chemistry. The transition period was the domain of the phlogiston theory of combustion, which had several forms and Priestley was a central figure who conducted experiments on different types of airs. Sometimes Priestley is denigrated because he called the materials airs rather than gases. The word gas, the term used in the 21st century, was invented by Helmont 1577 to 1644 to denote an occult principle inspired by the Greek word chaos, which in Dutch uses a G to represent the sound. In Vietnamese, liquids are generally called types of water, water being also the general word for fluid. So Priestley's use of the word air might be antiquated, but it does not indicate anything primitive in his thinking. Starting in 1930, the quantum theory began to explain the structure of the periodic table 
and rules of bonding and combination that previously were essentially separate axioms grouped into common themes, starting from a single differential equation. However, the periodic table has remained mostly valid, simply being a theorem rather than an axiom, with some small corrections and some significant additions into the age of quantum chemistry and the 21st century. With these differences in the lists of prime materials, something that is called one substance in alchemy might be called multiple substances in chemistry. This does not in and of itself indicate that chemistry is more correct or even more fundamental. It is a language issue. Something that is considered prime and simple in alchemy might be considered composite and complicated in chemistry. But also something that is prime in chemistry might be composite in the view of alchemy. They are different languages for describing materials. They classify materials differently. The definitions and classifications of chemistry circa 1700 are focused on where the substance was found, what its habit was, how it was prepared, and how it related to other substances in terms of how they were prepared. The definition of chemistry circa 1800 focuses on the theory of the elementary materials, which means the definition did not come from an explanation of how to prepare them or even so much from the way they behaved, at least not directly. In effect, the method of preparation was intended to be deduced from the rules of combination of the elementary substances in the theory, along, in practice, with implicit background information about materials often only discussed in advanced literature. This corresponds strongly to the complaint of Boyle and Freund that the alchemists did not explain themselves. What Boyle and Freund meant was that the information was not provided in terms of a few simple and definite axioms, but rather in terms of bulk of accumulated knowledge from which an intuition, a genuine and repeatable intuition, could be formed, but only by years of experience and perhaps requiring explicit apprenticeship. This is a curious resonance in the 21st century with the ascendancy of science by artificial intelligence, commonly known as AI. Research by AI involves a complicated numerical data crunching exercise in which a neural network or correlation matrix or decision tree is fitted to large amounts of measured data. As a result, the AI, famously, cannot explain what it is doing. It is the equivalent of the 17th century use of years of laboratory experience to train the biological neural network of the human brain to be able to consistently determine correct answers, but not to give short explanations. In this sense, AI-based research is a strongly retrograde step away from explainability and compact communicability of simple and effective theories back to a time of inexplicable intuition. 21st century teaching of chemistry starts the other way round to 17th century alchemy. While there is a small amount of pouring one solution into another to gain a white precipitate, by and large the focus is on the abstract theory of the elements of chemistry. Even in tertiary education, laboratory work involves nothing of the identification of materials in nature or about the texture or smell. In each laboratory practical, the student is handed yet another clear solution and told that it is one thing or another in terms of the theory of elements that they have been taught. So even though it is in a sense practical, it is a highly stylized form of practical in which the materials come pre-labeled according to the abstract theory. The laboratory experiments and tutorials are about demonstrating that the behavior deduced from the labels on the bottles via the abstract theory fits that obtained through practical composition, where the materials have been chosen carefully to almost certainly act that way even when abused by students. Due to the extreme level of setup and the dismissal of anything that does not fit the theory, this only gives a false certainty of the practical truth of the theory to the student. The student thus is much more being trained into seeing everything in terms of the abstract theory than in being shown that the theory is actually valid. The whole is not much different from a computer simulation. It is effectively not a demonstration of the theory, but an illustration of it. This is very different from teaching of mechanics. Such concepts as position and velocity are directly observable. Such rules as F equals MA are phrased as statements about the relation between components on the bench that the student can actually see. Imperfectly, perhaps, but nevertheless. 
Force can be specified merely as that which gravity or a spring provides without further presumption about the details of its composition. This, however, is only a matter of degree, but is a sufficient quantitative difference that makes a qualitative difference. In both cases, chemistry and mechanics, there is an abstract theory that exists independently of the physical manipulation of the devices and materials on the bench top, and there is a partial mapping from the theory to those devices and materials. The qualitative distinction is that for mechanics the student is taught the fairly simple correspondence between the variable x and the physical distance travelled. It can be perceived directly by the senses, but in chemistry the details of the molecular structure of the components of the solutions cannot be thus identified by human senses, nor is there any attempt to do so. In this sense, 16th century alchemy was far more oriented towards practical and experimental pursuits than chemistry has been since the 18th century. Hence, in reading older chemical texts under the name of alchemy, it is often required to go to great lengths to decode exactly what is going on. It is another language, not just in the sense of being older English or further back Latin, but also in the sense that there is no direct conversion between the terms. The 21st century has different ideas about which materials are prime and how to group materials into kinds. So the description of the meaning of an alchemical term in chemical terms can be complicated, as can the description of chemical terms in alchemical terms also be complicated. The languages are subject to different general background assumptions and principles. This seems in many ways to be due to a deliberate act by Antoine Lavoisier in that when he wrote the book Elementary Chemistry, he explicitly states that its approach is to replace the terminology with an entirely new language and to not spend any time in trying to explain what the older terms mean in the new language. Because this book and the school of thought founded from it were successful socially, at around the year 1800 in Europe the older language was quashed without ever there being anyone spending much time in writing down the translation. Priestley, who did write a valid but naive article on the problem of a social division that the action would cause, might have been better off providing the translation. Instead, he focused only on complaining about the lack of it. If he had provided the translation, I would judge he would have a far better reputation in the 21st century. Hence, to understand alchemy on its own terms, one has to learn new languages and new concepts. An entire culture that is 500 years gone and was never static anyway. A hundred years is a long time and the history of alchemy covers several thousand years and multiple major cultures. To see the reality of this, however, one has to get involved in the process of learning the materials and methods of mundane alchemy. What materials were defined and how were they defined? One good place to start is with the concepts related to acids. In alchemical terms, substances that taste sour. This includes precursors and products of acidic materials. Pay particular attention to this point. It is a myth that modern chemistry is somehow more practical and experimental than medieval alchemy. Modern chemistry uses non-observational definitions. Hydrogen is an element made from an atom of one proton and one electron. This is not something that we can perceive with our senses. In fact, it has no particular definitive simple test. It is determined by a complex of tests and theories with sophisticated instrumentation. Up even into the 19th century, much of identification of materials was more pragmatic. Touch, texture, taste and smell. Humphrey Davies died young because he tried breathing each of the gases that he discovered, as did Priestley. This is because their idea of science was ultimately pragmatic. How does a human experience these things? Eventually, we realize that a human cannot survive exposure to most of the things out there in the universe. We live because we are especially contained in a highly controlled environment. We can only go further and know more and perceive more with the use of our devices and instruments that allow us to do so in a manner that won't kill us. Getting back to acids, in particular there is vitriol. What is vitriol? According to one modern source, vitriol is an archaic word for sulfuric acid, but this is by far oversimplistic, misleading and not technically correct. 
This is in line with 20th century's tendency to define alchemical terms by a chemical term and then claim that the alchemist misunderstood or misidentified the material when the alchemy theory and practice does not agree with the chemical definition. Oil of vitriol might well be sulfuric acid, but so too might spirit of vitriol per campanin. There is more to it than that. Examination of the various sources, including alchemical writings and the first edition of the Chambers Cyclopedia, leads to the conclusion that vitriol means hydrated sulphate. Vitriol was a general term. Vitriols were said to be associated with metals. Blue vitriol contained copper, green vitriol contained iron, and so on. In modern terms, this seems to be hydrated copper sulphate, and so on. The Wikipedia states that oil of vitriol is sulfuric acid. Blue vitriol is copper sulphate pentahydrate. Green vitriol is iron sulphate hepahydrate. Red vitriol is cobalt sulphate. Sweet vitriol is diethyl ether. White vitriol is zinc sulphate. Identifying vitriol as meaning hydrated sulphate leads to the result that spirit, stuff driven off, of vitriol per campanin, bell jar with water, would be sulfuric acid regardless of which metal was associated with it. This is the source, in alchemical terms, of the grouping of the otherwise very different seeming materials. Curiously, Chambers has several comments that vitriol is an ingredient in several good black inks. See also Lapis Infernalis. Also, definitely Chambers talks of vitriol as a solid, not a liquid. It reads as though vitriol is a mineral, as is calamine. Distilled vinegar is mentioned as vitriolic acid. Chambers says Lapis Infernalis is silver dissolved in nitric acid and left to crystallise. It does, however, start to feel as though several terms are really terms of sulfuric acid prepared in different ways. Aquafortis is a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acids, famed for being able to dissolve gold. Spirit of vitriol is vitriol dried in the sun or heated in a fire and then distilled several times, first by reverberatory fire and then balino mara. Technically, it seems to me that there are multiple spirits of vitriol, some references talk about the last spirit drawn from vitriol, for example. This makes some sense. Spirit is a general term for stuff that is driven off by heat and then depositive, e.g. as flowers. Paraphrase. Vitriol is a kind of fossil or mineral salt found in copper mines. It is more properly ranked among the class of semi-metals as having a metallic matter mixed or combined with its salt, while Harvey defines vitriol as a saline metallic transparent glebe soluble in water, fusible and calcinable by fire. End of paraphrase. Reading further, it seems clear that they are aware of this. That is, white vitriol has little metal, blue vitriol has copper, green has iron. This suggests that true vitriol is hydrated copper sulphate and that other vitriols, including white, red and green, are in chemical terms different substances formed by processing copper sulphate. The Chambers Cyclopedia defines glebe, gleba, in natural history, chymistry, etc., a clod or piece of earth containing some metal or mineral, see ore, see also marcasite, metal, etc. The glebes are carried to the forges to be washed, purified, melted, etc. On the nature of acids, mostly from the section on acids in Chambers Cyclopedia, 1728, page 22, ACI. Acid, anything which affects the tongue with a sense of sharpness and sourness. Acids are usually divided into manifest and dubious. The manifest acids are those above defined which impress the idea sensibly, such as vinegar and its spirits. The juices of citrons, oranges, spirit of nitre, spirit of alum, spirit of vitriol, spirit of sulphur per campanin, spirit of sea salt, etc. Dubious acids those which do not retain enough of the acid nature to give sensible marks thereof on the taste but agree with the manifest acids in some other properties sufficient to refer to them in the same class hence it appears that there are some characters of acidity more general than those of sharp taste though it is that taste that is chiefly regarded as the denomination the great and general criterion then of acids is that they make a violent effervescence when mixed with another sort of body called alkalis. 
Yet it is not this property alone universally to be depended on to determine a body an acid, without the joint consideration of the taste and the change of colour producible in other bodies thereby. To distinguish dubious acids from alkalis, mix them with a blue tincture of violets. If they turn it red, they are of an acid tribe, if green, alkaline. End of quote. Chambers also states that acids are of the tribe of salts, being specifically the acid salts. What is spirit of? Chambers, page 112, SPI. Spirits in medicine means the most subtle and volatile parts or juices of the body by means whereof all the functions and operations are thereof performed. The spirits are usually distinguished into vital and animal. The ancients made a fourfold distinction of spirits into vital, animal, natural and genital, whereof the first they placed in the heart, the second in the brain, the third in the stomach and the liver, and the last in the testicles. But as this division is founded on a false hypothesis, it is now deservedly set aside. A little bit later, spirit of sulphur is a spirit drawn from sulphur melted and inflamed. The most subtle part whereof is converted into liquor by sticking to a glass bell suspended over it, whence it falls drop by drop into a trough in the middle whereof is placed the stone pot wherein the sulphur is burnt. End of quote. Animal spirits, then, are specific to the brain and some doubted they exist. So spirits just means the most volatile parts, for example of a rose, but the above passages indicate that spirit of sulphur per campanon is an acid. Also from Chambers. In chymistry, not only presence or absence of air, but even its being barely opened or enclosed, is of great consequence. Thus, campfire fired in a closed vessel runs whole into salts, whereas if during the process the cover be removed and a candle applied, the whole flies off in fume. So to make sulphur inflammable, it requires a free air. In a closed concurvate, it may be sublimed a thousand times without kindling. Sulphur, being put under a glass bell and a fire applied, rises into spirit of sulphur per campanum. But if there be the least chink whereby included air communicates with the atmosphere, it immediately kindles. So an ounce of charcoal enclosed in a crucible, well loaded, will remain without loss for 14 days in the intensest heat of a melting furnace, though the thousandth part of the fire in open air will presumably turn it into ashes. End of quote. The oil of sulphur seems to be sulfuric acid. It is also referred to as being acidic, but some sources say that it also contains the gas. Does that mean hydrogen sulphide? Modern chemistry, when sulphur powder is heated, it may produce gaseous products which fly away. This gives the illusion that it is reducing in mass when heated. Gases are likely to contain sulphur dioxide. When SO2 is dissolved in water, you get H2SO3, sulfuric acid. The per campanum means in a bell jar with water, so it means dissolved in water, and hence sulfuric acid. So spirit of sulphur per campanum would be sulfuric acid. Magnesium chloride, heated, hydrolyzes to magnesium oxide and hydrogen chloride gas, similar with sodium chloride. So spirit of sea salt would be hydrogen chloride gas, Magnesium chloride is deliquescent and forms MgCl2-6H2O. Hence, the water is available when it is heated. In several cases in the literature, it feels as though spirit of actually implies per campanum, which implies dissolved in water. Much of the reference material for this essay is taken from what is described on the title page as Cyclopedia or an Universal Dictionary of Arts and Sciences containing the definitions of the terms and accounts of things signified thereby in several arts, both liberal and mechanical, and the several sciences, human and divine. The figures, kinds, properties, productions, preparations and uses of things natural and artificial, the rise, progress and state of things ecclesiastical, civil, military and commercial, with the several systems, sects, opinions, etc., among philosophers, divines, mathematicians, physicians, antiquaries, critics, etc., the whole intended as a course of ancient and modern learning, 
compiled from the best authors, dictionaries, journals, memoirs, transactions, ephemerides, etc. in several languages in two volumes by E. Chambers, Gent. Floriferous at apis in saltibus omnia libent, omnia nos, Lucretius. Printed for James and John Napton, John Darby, Daniel Midwinter, Arthur Betsworth, John Senex, Robert Gosling, John Pemberton, William and John Innes, John Osborne and Tho Longman, Charles Rivington, John Hook, Ranu Robinson, Francis Clay, Aaron Ward, Edward Simon, Daniel Brown, Andrew Johnson and Thomas Osborne, 1728. End of quote. Note, there is a full stop or period after Tho, suggesting an abbreviation. I do not know exactly what that is for certain. The Latin quote is incomplete. It translates to declaration of the love of all things. In short, it is the first edition of the Chambers Encyclopedia.